session. Really appreciate everybody being here. And so we're gonna be talking about how to use citizen science and um, integrate it with a decision support system known as the Environmental Evaluation Modeling System. Um, and um, getting into it, it's important to look at the big picture and recognize that we're losing ground right now in our fight to conserve biodiversity, not only with uh, rare species, but also individuals. This is the Living Planet Index, and we've lost more than 50% of the individuals on the planet since 1970. And one of the primary uh, drivers of that is habitat degradation, as well as invasive species and disease. And um, lately, it's become more and more apparent that wildfire is something that we need to put on our radar as uh, ecologists and conservation biologists. We've always been trained in Ecology 101 that wildfire is really important for the ecosystems, but the amount of s the scale and magnitude of fire that's happening now due to climate change is really quite overwhelming and, and I would imagine is, is um, kind of a sleeping threat for conservation biology. And um, so I'll come back to that slide in a minute. One of the major issues with wildfire is that it opens the landscape up for invasive exotics to really move in. And, and, and when you have invasives comes in, it's not super intuitive, but they just really mess with the whole ecosystem and the balance. Um, also, fires are causing huge losses of topsoil and degradation of water quality. Also, um, mudslides. Here's a, a, a picture from Montecito, California, in which 91 people were, died because these mudslides came through the town and surprised everybody. So many people got injured, so much loss of, of um, property. And so we need these, we need post wildfire management systems. And here's uh, something I came up with on Sunday, which is the post wildfire restoration management system, for lack of a better name. Um, names, uh, comments are welcome. And so it's kind of this Venn diagram of wildfire recovery management, invasive species management, and erosion control, water quality, topsoil retention. Asking this question, where should we do restoration? And the system itself is replicable anywhere at multiple scales, uh, customizable to the local priorities, and it's envisioned to link with an adaptive management actions database, um, possibly in a link to knowledge graph. It's good to see Patrick here in the audience. Um, so where should we restore? Um, this is a key question. You, you can create maps that show uh, good priority areas. And um, in this case, we combined all that data that we talked about, the citizen science data, which was really critical, with existing data to create a huge observations database and then combine that with 11 other GIS layers into this um, logic model and analysis in the environmental evaluation modeling system. So what is EAMS? It's, it's a system that's built and designed for collaboratively building and using models, working together as partnerships. It's open source. It can be used to build models by anyone. And um, it's really great in this collaborative development because it's transparent. You can see the inputs, you can see the structures. And so when you're looking at it on the screen at any given EAMS model, you can see on the left side, you can see the model, the logic model. You can click on the boxes to see what the structure is, the operators, the weights, the thresholds. That's all transparent. And then you can see the maps that go along with each click. Um, it's also modular. You can build each branch on its own. You can transfer one branch from one project to another, one region to another. And, um, and that's the, another power of it. It's built on this concept of fuzzy logic and especially uh, fuzzy sets, which is this idea that when you're looking at nature and ecology, it's not a black and white world out there. A lot of times there's gradients. So in this example, we've got a gradient of road density. And so you're able to um, have these continuous functions and incorporate them into your logic. Um, and when you're building your EMS models, you can do it in ArcGIS Model Builder or in command line, either one. And, um, and then you upload it either into EAMS Online, which is on the left, which is an app designed specifically for viewing it, or into Databasin, which has a little pop-up viewer for that graphical user interface. And I'll show you those uh, demonstrations in a minute here. Um, the post-wildfire management system logic at this highest level is invasive management priority, and um, then also erosion priority and low regenerative capacity, and I'll explain those in a little bit more detail. 
As far as the invasive management priority, we built on the Whippet tool, and we're calling it Whippet Plus. And so this is a fantastic model and tool that um, is an ArcGIS model that allows you to run a model with a whole bunch of inputs. And so for each species on the landscape, you're mapping out all the populations of that species and the relative priority of managing those species regarding the ecological impact, the invasiveness, and the management facility of each population. And so with Whippet Plus, we re-engineered it, put it into EAMS so it's transparent and replicable, and it also runs automatically for all the species on your landscape. And then you can view all those, um, all those bells and whistles. We also added some additional criteria that can be turned on and off if you want to be a uh, fundamentalist to, to Whippet. And um, I think I need to skip this slide, which, well, real quick, it's really digging into each one, each one of those things, such as each ecological impact. It has a whole bunch of sub-criteria, such as um, is the species in an ecologically sensitive area or not? And you can have a whole branch underneath that. Um, what's the size and density of the population? And so on and so forth for each one of those branches. And then for erosion, this is um, a great thing about EAMS is you can combine these multiple objectives and in a weighted combination. And so if you really wanted to just focus on invasives, you can turn the weight off for erosion. But if you're being funded by Proposition 1 to look at erosion, you can turn that on. <laughs> and so that's what we're doing. And um, you can see, are you, is there observed erosion? Um, what are areas are modeled to have erosion? And also what, um, locations are expected to have low rate of plant regeneration. And so when it comes to low rates of plant re regeneration, um, we use the PREP tool, which was a, a regenerative capacity and really builds on this idea of that certain ecological um, communities are going to have different restoration potential after a fire. And so like if there's a lot of burls that like, like fire, they'll re-sprout and you don't need to worry about lo topsoil loss there. But if it's um, other you know, seed required areas, then it's gonna be a whole different story. And so now we're going to switch to this. Okay, here we have the results of the post wildfire restoration management system. And uh, this is for the entire study area. This is on databasin.org, an online GIS data viewing platform. Uh, created by Conservation Biology Institute and available for reviews for all of you. And um, thanks again for Wilberforce and other partners for uh, funding the creation of this system. And if you want to look at the area just where the Forest Service is, it's just a, a portion of the study area, there's still some areas in red and orange that are coming up as high priority for restoration um, in different areas. And so you can zoom into the area right behind Montecito, for instance, and you can see that there's an area of particular interest. And um, you can go ahead also and explore the logic model that went into it. And so here is that invasive species branch. And you can see, yeah, for this area, it's invasive species is, is really lighting up this particular location. Erosion management priority, uh, there's a lot of high priority areas. You can kind of even see that for the whole extent. Um, what that looks like. And so um, you can also go ahead and explore each one of the, you know, the branches all the way down. You know, so for instance, risk of soil slips um, has shaking potential, slope, um, soil burn severity. You can see what that looks like for the whole region. So um, getting back to our um, sub area, you can also, um, you can also kind of back out of this a little bit, going back to the invasive species. You can kind of see what um, different invasive species were there via the model. But you could also go ahead and explore the underlying data of the model in database. And this is one of the things that's nice about it um, that you cannot do on eamsonline.org. And so, Looking underneath it, you can see what the landscape looks like. You can turn on different data layers. So here's the invasive species observations, for instance, and you can identify um, any one of these. And here's the actual picture that was taken in, um, let's see, in 
database and there's a castor bean location there and also a um, another castor bean location observation. You can see details of the observations and even go ahead and, and click all the way through to the iNaturalist observation. Um, now what we did is we um, created invasive species populations based on the observations um, using a, a standard of practice of about um, a quarter mile between observations is um, the minimum, uh, the maximum uh, allowed. And you can go ahead and, and identify the populations that are present at a particular location. So for, for instance, right here, you have this observation um, where we've got five different species populations. We've got a fennel population. You can zoom out to see the ex extent of that fennel population, what's gonna be involved to tackle that. Uh, but also there's other smaller populations that might be more manageable, like the giant reed population that's there, uh, the castor bean population that's there, the top of the sticky snake root population, which is good to tackle from the upstream side and French broom. So this might be a really good location to start doing some restoration efforts. Okay, there's more, more that could be said here. You could explore other uh, data layers that are in the database. Um, and uh, thank you. Okay, you can also view the data in EAMS online which is another graphical user interface that we created. And, and this user interface is a little bit faster for clicking through and exploring the different um, components of the logic model. Like here we are in risk of soil slips. There's the soil burn severity model. Um, and so, yeah. And then also in this, um, you also have the opportunity to go ahead and explore the um, changing of the weights and you can go ahead and type in different weights, for instance, uh, and you know, go ahead and run the model and uh, go ahead and see what the results look like in the differences. So that would go ahead and run. And in a second, you get to go ahead and um, see what that looks like as far as the, uh, the results. And so here's the result that runs. And in case you couldn't see, I was doing a weight of 0 0.4, 0 0.4, and 0 0.2 instead of even weights. And so you can compare the new run to the original run. You can see up here, um, it gets a higher relative weight, less relative weight down here. Uh, you know, you can zoom into the region we were looking at earlier and see, you know, how that's different. And um, so, uh, yeah, that's how everything is looking right now. And um, thank you for your attention. Oh, the reason this is blurry is because I ran the model at map quality low, which was the fastest. Okay. Uh, yeah, I should, I guess, probably point out also that for any time you go ahead and press on a particular location, it will go ahead and um, tell you what the relative value is for all of those particular cells. So for this particular cell uh, reporting unit, the invasive management priority was a 0.85 on a scale of zero to one, erosion 0.74 and low regenerative capacity is a um, scale of zero. Weighted sum is a 0.53. Once you normalize that for the region, you get your top value of 0.86. So thank you. Is the overview of, um, of using it. So the, here's the backup slides that we don't need to use. And um, just wrapping up here. Um, so uh, I should put the caveat that we use what's known as EAMS extended in the fact that regular EAMS is fuzzy logic, as I mentioned before. And um, 
with Eames Extended, we're using fuzzy sets to define the input variables and, and normalize them, but then we combine them using weighted linear combination, which is weighted sums. Um, we do that, A, because um, it's consistent with Whippet, so people that are no Whippet will be familiar with this. Also, um, you know, there's, uh, we need some social scientists out there to evaluate the cognitive differences and, and pros and cons of, of those two, and that would be an interesting analysis. So as far as future work and applications goes, um, yeah, the idea is to link it with an adaptive action spatial database, and the vision for a future application of this would be to be able to really spin, to spin up the GIS layer using existing data in year one so that you can actually get a rapid assessment going and you can get on the ground field work going in that critical first 12 months after the fire. And then you can be gathering additional data to fine tune that. So that's like the, the take home message there. And this can be done at multiple scales, of course. And um, so um, by, as, by way of follow up, I really encourage anybody that's interested to email me um, and you can ask to be on the mailing list for um, the manuscripts that are in process um, or the preprint that's available. Um, and also, to, you know, to co-develop co a grant or an application, or really any EAMS collaboration, you can see that you can do this for conservation planning, not just management. And um, a huge shout out to the co-authors um, and all the citizen scientists and everybody else that, that helped make this possible. Um, Josie Lesage was uh, my uh, special partner in crime. And, um, and then a special thanks to Steve Winhager, who I wrote the grant proposal with. And um, yeah, thanks to everybody else there. And thanks to um, Rebecca uh, for coming out here to present and being a co-author and, and Greg, who's coming up next. So uh, thank you all very much. Thank <laughs> you.